This is a Toast for Planning Committee. Hello. 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 This is the test. Hello.
Good morning. Welcome to this meeting of the planning committee taking place from the Walton Suite Winchester Guildhall. It's Wednesday the 14th of June and the time is 9.30 a.m. My name is Councillor Jane Rutter and I am the chair of the planning committee. Around the table we have the elected members of the committee um, and my deputy chair is to my right. Um, we're also supported today by a number of officers, Lorna Hutchins, the planning manager, Dan Lucas, our legal advisor, uh, Claire Buchanan, who is taking the minutes and clerking for this meeting and uh, operating the tech, thank goodness. And uh, we also have case officers who will be sitting here. Um, this is the case officer for the first item. This meeting is being live streamed and recorded to the Council's YouTube channel. Subtitles are available and advice on how to turn this on is set out on the website. Please can I remind everyone to ensure their mobile phones are on silent or preferably turned off entirely. In the unlikely event that it is necessary to evacuate the building, the fire alarm will sound. Please follow all the instructions given to you by our team. There is a handout provided on your chairs, and I hope you notice the information slides displayed as you walked in for further guidance about the meeting. These will also be displayed whenever there is a break in the proceedings. Finally, I'd like to welcome members of the public to the meeting. Those of you who are registered to speak, I will invite you forward when it is time for you to make your contribution. The microphone is turned on by pressing the button on the base of the unit and a timer will appear on the screen to remind you of your remaining time. And that timer won't start until you start speaking. Right, we now turn to the agenda. Claire, do we have any apologies and deputy members? Yes, we do, Chair. So apologies for absence received from Councillor Lee with Councillor Wallace deputising and from Councillor Reid with Councillor Pearson deputising. Thank you. Thank you. Members, do we have any disclosures of interest, please? Councillor Laming. Yes, on the... Uh, Can you speak louder and yeah. into the microphone? On the second item on the agenda, I am the Ward Councillor and I attended the Parish Council meeting where this was discussed. I think that part of it still have an open mind on this particular application. OK. Thanks, Councillor. Did you vote at all on the planning application in any way or did you? No, I'm just go there as the Ward Councillor. I don't have anything to do with the Parish Council apart from sit there and listen. Oh, you're not a member of the Parish Council? No, that's fine. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Councillor Laming. Thank you, Dan. <coughs> any other disclosures of interest? No? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, we now turn to the minutes of the previous meeting. Are those agreed? OK, thank you. Where appropriate, can we accept the update sheet? Yes, it is appropriate. Can we accept the update sheet, please, as an addendum to the agenda? Is that agreed? Thank you. <clears throat> we now turn to the planning applications. <clears throat> The first item is number six on your agenda at Willow Tree Stables, Forest Road, Denmead. <clears throat> the officer presenting is Liz Young. If you'd like to give us your presentation. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Chair. So this application relates to the change of use of an existing building to a dog grooming salon. Uh, the existing building was previously used the storage purposes in association with the private equestrian use. Just moving to the first slide, you can see at the top right of the page there's the site layout plan and then there's the location plan at the bottom left. You can see the application site highlighted in red. This includes both the application building and the parking area to the south. You can see from the site layout plan at the top um, that the building sits in a cluster of other buildings which sit immediately south of Forest Road in Denmead. Um, the access lies approximately just over 300 metres to the west. Just moving on to the next slide, this shows the aerial photograph 
looking towards the site at the centre of the page, you can see marked by the yellow star. Um, as you can see, it lies in open countryside. Um, again, say immediately south of Forest Road, it backs onto open fields, which fall within the same ownership as the site. The grey rectangular area you can see to the southwest is a riding arena, which also falls in the same ownership. The site is not directly adjoined by any other residential properties. Closest one being approximately 80 metres across the road to the northwest. Moving on to the next slide, um, this shows the full plans. So at the top of the page, you have the elevations with floor plan below. Um, no external changes have been carried out to accommodate the use. The floor plan you can see at the bottom of the page shows how the space has been adapted internally to accommodate the use. It occupies an external footprint of just over 20 square metres. Um, so in terms of the use itself, this would run between, well, it wouldn't run outside the hours of nine and four Monday to Saturday. Clients, the daily number of clients would range between one and four. Uh, appointments would be between one and three hours. Um, well, all appointments would be pre-booked and the majority of customers would, that's about two thirds, would come from Denmead, Waterlooville and Herbrook. Just moving on to the site photographs. The first photo, so I'll just wait for that to come up. First photo you can see looks directly towards the application building. On the right, there's the existing stable storage building on the left. Moving on to the next slide. This just shows a longer range view looking towards again towards the application building. So looking north towards the buildings and Forest Road. Um, you can see the parking area there in the foreground. Just moving on to the next slide, this shows the existing site access off Forest Road, which is a C classified highway. No changes have been undertaken to the access. Just moving on to the final slide, final photograph. This is the view looking east towards the application site uh, as you approach along the access track. So that brings us to the end of the slides. Um, just in conclusion, uh, it's considered that the proposed change of use is in accordance with both the NPPF and also local plan policy MTRA4, which together support the reuse of rural buildings for employment purposes. This particular building also meets the requirements of MTRA4 in that it's structurally sound. The use has been accommodated without any external changes. Um, but also the scale, both the building and the use have been can be undertaken without impacting on the character of the area or the amenities of neighbouring properties. So the recommendation is that permission should be granted um, with conditions restricting the use to dog grooming only and also the hours stated on the application. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. We now move to the um, contributions from members of the public. We have uh, a parish council representative, Councillor Kevin Angioli. If you'd like to come forward, please, Councillor Angioli. You know the routine, and I think you've been here before a few times. You're ready and settled. The timer will begin. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning, members. Um, Demnitz Parish Council raised three points in our objection to this application. Uh, Manchester City Council's local plan policy MTRA4 
uh, development in the countryside. This application is contrary to this policy in our view, which states that only development which has an operational need for a countryside location, such as agriculture, horticulture or forestry will be permitted. A dog grooming salon is not part of the rural economy. Our second point was that the property is in an unsustainable location requiring car journeys. It should be noted that uh, it's mentioned in the application that Robles Dog Park is not part of or not adjoining or uh, this uh, application. Forest Road is at that point a 60 mile an hour zone with no lighting and no pavement. Safe access can only be made in a vehicle and this is not a sustainable location in the climate change emergency. The application makes no provision for the disposal of grey water or foul waste. That was our three points. I'd like to uh, point out that the officer's report is incorrect in at least two areas. Uh, she states that the site is not in or near a flood zone. Reference to the Environment Agency's flood maps shows that the site is 40 metres from both a flood zone 2 and a flood zone 3. As the perusal of Google's mapping shows, a land drain along the edge of the site leads into the tributary of the River Wallington, which is at the centre of those flood zones. And the officer's report states that there is no, there are no foul water requirements and the amount of dog waste will be minimal and carried away. She makes no comment about grey water. One of our concerns, bathing dogs produces grey water and no provision has been made in the application for the safe disposal of it. Given the proximity to local water courses, we raised an objection on that point. Then we parish council ask that you reject this application. Thank you. Very much. <clears throat> Members, do we have any questions of clarification for the parish councillor? No, thank you very much. You may return to your seat. Thank, thank you. you. And next we have the agent Robert Tutton on behalf of the um, applicant. If you'd like to come forward, Robert. Good morning. Again, you know the routine. You have three minutes when you're ready. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to present this deputation in favour of my client's proposal and the officer. Is, is that sound all right? And the officer's positive recommendation. In order to support a prosperous rural economy, Section 84 of the NPPF calls for the growth and expansion of all types of business in rural areas. And Section 85 recognises that in order to meet local business and community needs, some sites may have to be found beyond existing settlement in locations not well served by public transport. <laughs> Such development should, however, be sensitive to its surroundings and not have an unacceptable impact on local roads. The use of previously developed land is encouraged. In similar vein, policy MTRA4 of your council's adopted core strategy provides for small scale business use in the countryside that is, and I quote, appropriate to the site, location and the setting and does not cause harm to the character and landscape of the area or neighbouring uses or create inappropriate noise, light and traffic generation. A site notice was displayed 18 weeks ago and drew support from 43 respondents. Public consultation serves no useful purpose if responses are simply put aside. Denmead Parish Council has presented an objection together with one resident of World's End in Hamilton. The Highway and Drainage Authorities have been consulted and neither has raised objection. Chair, I have revisited the application site since the officer's report was published to exercise my own judgment in the manner required by the development plan and the NPPF. In my submission, none of the matters raised by the Denmead Parish Council are of such moment as to justify re refusal of planning permission. In view of the positive presumption generated by the development plan, I'm satisfied that the officers are right 
to conclude that permission should be granted. So members are requested to accept the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Tutton. Members, do we have any questions or clarification for this speaker? Yes, Councillor Gordon-Smith. I wonder if you could help me. When the dogs are being groomed, are they washed? There is a bath. So they are washed, or some of them at any rate are washed. I've, I've not witnessed one being bathed, I have to say. But right. So there, there is a bath there that I saw myself yesterday. Right. Thank you. Councillor Ashville. Thank you. Um, could you just confirm uh, how many dogs will be uh, using the facilities daily? What? Well, a day? Three or four. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions, members? Councillor Wallace. Uh, I was just going to ask Daniel, actually. Uh, I'd like to ask about the supporting representations, the 43. Is it appropriate for me to ask? Um, it, should I be asking the officer or uh, the representative? I think the officer. Wait, wait your you. questions to the officer. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Tutton as the agent representative of the applicant? No? Thank you very much, Mr. Tutton. You may return to your seat. Okay. Uh, Liz, is, is the case officer, would you like to um, make any comments before we go to questions? Anything that's been brought up that you haven't properly covered? Um, there was just one point about the MTRA4 policy, um, just picking up on the that following the parish comments in relation to the criteria. I mean, what the policy does is it lists the types of development that are permitted. Um, so one of those being, as, as mentioned, um, businesses which have a need for a rural location. Uh, but it also lists a number of other types of development which will be permitted and one of those being the reuse of rural buildings for employment purposes. So it's quite a broad criteria that's listed. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. OK, members, I'm going to take the report as a whole. So if you've got any questions for our case officer, about the report or what you've heard from our public participation. Um, now's the time, Councillor Wallace, thank you. Uh, I noted that there are 43 supporting representations on this uh, proposal. That is uh, an unusually high number. Um, do you, uh, is there a split of those? Is, can you give us any more information about that? Sorry, what, what was it you wanted to know? about the representations? Is it just, uh, I don't know if it's clear, is it just clients or is it local people or? Uh... Well, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't know what their connection was with the proposal. I mean, in terms of where they originate from, it's a broad area, so not restricted to the local area, so. You do have an opportunity to look at the uh, representations before the meeting, you know, Councillor Wallace, they're on the uh, website. OK, Councillor Pearson, thank you. Uh, Liz, if I may ask you, I understand this site was an equestrian one prior to this application. Is that correct? I think it says that in your report. That's for private equestrian use. Uh, also, an agricultural contracting use has also run from the site, both of those. Sorry, I, I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. Sorry, an agricultural contracting use also alongside a private equestrian use. Both of those have had previous consent. What I'm asking, I presume the facilities for keeping horses on the site, i.e. relating to drainage, are still in existence. Yeah, well, my understanding is the equestrian use is, you know, an ongoing use that's part and parcel yeah. of the site as it is. Yeah, OK, thank you. Microphone, Councillor Pearson. If you could just switch off your microphone. Thank you. Any more questions, members? Uh, OK. So we move to debate.
Who would like to start debate? Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it seems to me that this is a very small premises, that it is an, an area that is already used for uh, employment involving animals. It's a small number of customers coming by appointment. And I recognise it as a proposal to reuse existing rural building for a business use as permitted by uh, MTRA4. Uh, I shall be supporting the proposal. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Councillor Pearson. Yeah, yeah, so thank you for the report. There's uh, really not very much to ask, hence the silence for the planning committee. I, I support what Liz has concluded about this site. It's yes, it is in the countryside. It is uh, arguably rural. I, my family has used similar facilities in Lower Upham out in the countryside. There were no issues from that site, and this site looks like a very similar situation. I would also support it because it is allows diversification of existing buildings rather than letting them fall into rack and ruin. And of course, it's an employment site as well. So I don't know of any um, policies that uh, this hasn't raised. So I re reiterate that I do support this application. Thank you, Liz. Any further debate, members? Councillor Gordon-Smith. Um, I Earlier on, I raised the concern about whether the dogs were washed or not. And I've got a short-haired dog that doesn't get washed. But um, I know with other ones, more complicated ones, they do tend to wash them. And my concern with this is uh, that Dogs are often treated with uh, anti-flea products. And when they're washed, this is comes off with them. And we have a problem in rural sites, rural areas, with, kid, uh, with the dogs going into streams and the, this very powerful insecticide getting washed off and into the streams and having quite a serious effect on insects. So I, I would be very interested to have um, more details about uh, how much, how frequently this washing occurs, and the subsequent disposal of the waste water. Um, obviously, th there's always a bit of a problem with these reusing these old sites. That it, it's a sort of thin end of the wedge syndrome, and uh, we've had lots of cases in the area of agricultural buildings being reused and is it an agricultural business is it something else and so on and that then you get a lot of subsequent problems but i think in this instance it's reusing quite a small building uh, i don't think they can be adapted for any other use um, but if i could have some reassurance on the waste water issue which i think is quite important i would be happy to uh, support this OK, would you like to see an extra condition put on about grey water? Uh, yes, I would. I think it, it could be quite, quite critical and it's, it doesn't need to be covered at all. Um, and it doesn't we'll, be much. We'll, we'll just find out yes. how reasonable that is, given okay. the existing and previous use right. okay. of the horses and all that. I think in this case, Chair, it's reasonable to, to attach that. Um, it, we, we've looked at the foul water drainage um, and this proposal isn't proposing to connect to the mains for any other drainage situation. So we could ask for more details just to ask for how that is being dealt with. That's a normal condition that we would attach. So that would be reasonable. Thank you very much, Mr Hutchins. Right. So um, are we agreed that we should add that condition just asking for details about how grain water is going to be dealt with? And so that we are assured that it's not going to go into the and cause any issues in this the water course. OK, thank you.
OK, I think that's agreed. Members will add that condition to that will be condition four. Um, and I will agree the exact wording of that with our officers. OK, I don't think there's any more contributions to debate. I think we've heard everything. OK, can I see all those members in favour of the recommendation that this application be approved? All members, please. Yeah, that is all members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Um, OK, thank you. We'll have a short pause whilst we change the case officer um, and then we will be moving on to the next item. Thank you. Very On our agenda is uh, 116 Oliver's Battery Road South in Oliver's Battery. <clears throat> the presenting officer is Catherine Watson. If you'd like to give us your presentation, please, Kat. Thank you. Sorry, Kat, can you put your microphone on, please? Is that what that is? <laughs> uh, the application is for a replacement dwelling at 116 Oliver's Battery Road South. Here we can see uh, the site plan. Um, just to make, uh, just to clarify that members undertook a site visit on Monday um, where they um, looked at the, prop at the site from number 114, which is just to the um, a top above the site and number 118 which is below the site and again from the road um, members didn't enter the site because it's an active building site um, but um, uh, neighbours were available to to speak to um, where necessary so here we have the proposed site plan so we can see um, the uh, building uh, location. Um, we can see it in relation to the buildings on either side, although the slide as shown on the screen is a little bit uh, faded. Um, and we see that there's a garage to the front of the property with an additional three parking spaces. Here we can see uh, the elevations as they were uh, before the demolition of the existing bungalow. So it's a, a fairly traditional uh, bungalow uh, to the front and rear, um, quite long, um, runs quite far into the plot. And here we can see the um, existing plan. So on the left hand of the screen, we've got the ground floor plan and on the right hand uh, side of the screen, We've got the first floor plan. And here we can see the proposed elevation. So um, top left is the front elevation. Um, top right is the side elevation that adjoins number 114. Uh, bottom left is the rear elevation. And then bottom right is the side elevation that adjoins number 118. Here we've got the proposed plan. So again, on the right hand side, we've got the first floor accommodation. Uh, and on the left hand side, we've got the ground floor, floor accommodation. <clears throat> and here are the um, plans and elevations for the uh, proposed garage. So these photos show the site um, and the surroundings prior to the development. So the top right hand photo um, shows the bungalow as it was. So it's the, the building that's on the right hand side of that photo. Um, and then the other um, photos show the wider context of the area. And then um, these are photos taken from neighbouring properties um, whilst the, the building is, is under construction. 
Um, so these have been taken um, from uh, number 118. Um, no, yes, 118. Um, and uh, we can see uh, this is uh, the left, left hand side is the side elevation that, that runs along um, the boundary. And then the right hand side is we can see this, uh, the uh, dwelling at 118 and the building under construction. Uh, since these photos were taken, the, the construction has continued um, and it's actually the uh, now built to its full height. Uh, and here we've got more views from 118. So top left hand corner, that's adjacent to the boundary um, and that's just showing the side elevation. Top right, again, similar view. And then um, bottom left, similar view, but taken from a bit further away. And then bottom right, again, just to show the um, elevation from the side. And these are some photos taken from 114. Um, so along the side boundary uh, that adjoins the site. So again, you can see um, the relationship between uh, the proposed the build the dwelling that's being built and the boundary with number one one four. As I say, the the building has um, moved on since these photographs were taken, and um, it uh, the it's been built to its full height uh, to ridge height so far. And then. Um, the top left hand corner shows um, the development um, viewed from 1112. So that's uh, next door, but one to the north. Um, and then um, the bottom uh, photographs and uh, top right show from the street, different views from the street. That concludes my presentation. My recommendation is to permit um, subject to the conditions uh, that um, are listed. Um, just also to say that the update sheet does contain a number of conditions that the, the wording has been amended um, to make it to change it from pre commencement to pre occupation, uh, because obviously this is a re partly retrospective application. Uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kat. Now we move on to uh, public representation. Um, so we have two objectors registered, Susan Summers and Belinda. Belinda, <laughs> excuse me. What's up, Chiki? Um, you're very welcome. Um, I assume that you've decided between you how you're going to arrange your three minutes. OK, well, when you're ready, you have three minutes between you. Thank you. We have. We object. The two large first floor rear windows have a direct view into habitable rooms, dining room, kitchen, lounge and bedroom of 30 Compton Way. In winter, when deciduous trees in both gardens are leaf free, our habitable rooms will be overlooked, invade, invading our privacy, um, our personal privacy. A condition is requested that the evergreen laurel hedge at the end of 116 Oliver's Battery Road South will be maintained across the width of the plot to a height of no more than 3.2 metres, that's 10 foot, with a planting at least one metre from boundary with no part of hedge touching the wall to reduce risk of damage to neighbour's wall and foundation integrity. Failure to do so could lead to owners 116 liable for repairs. Our um, main objection to the building next door to us is the fact that we've lost a lot of light which we previously had to the south side of our home. Bathroom lights have always to be on if we are to see properly in that room. And we've also lost a lot of light which we did have on days such as this to our lounge at the back of the house. Um, the house next door has a feel of want over need and it has completely changed the streets in Oliver's battery. Um, we were responsible for alerting the council to the fact the building had been completely demolished. Um, therefore, there was now a new build for which there had not been any application to, as they were aware. Um, that's subsequently been applied for retrospectively. And um, by then, of course, the house had come along leaps and bounds. It, um, 
it begs the questions of why bother to have rules and regulations, local plans, village plans, when all other residents are forced to comply with this as much as possible. If someone else can come in and those rules suddenly don't apply. Um, and, you know, if you're hoping to have good relationships with people forged going forward, then obviously to be honest up front and clear about what your attention, intentions are would obviously work in your favour. We feel this wasn't done. Each one of the direct neighbours to this house has been affected by this building and it's certainly brought many of our neighbours in the larger community of Oliver's Battery out to object. Something they did not do in the first instance when the first sort of plans were um, apparently uh, submitted. And this was possibly because they never saw an orange sign, neither we, did we. Um, the first orange sign we saw was this year when retrospective planning was applied for and that's when 30 or more people came and raised objections. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, members, do we have any questions of clarification for our public speakers? Yes, Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you. You have an image on the screen. Yes. Showing a sight line. Could you just clarify the distance between the two buildings? If you go down the page, you, there is um, dimensions on there. It's all described on my objection. I believe the the windows that are in the um, the windows on the left hand side of the new build are roughly twenty four meters from the boundary. And the boundary is how far from the other property? From from our property, yeah. it is we are forty meters from our boundary. However, the new build is much higher in elevation, and our bungalow is much lower mm -hmm. in elevation. So the actual sight line is 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 more dramatic because of the differences mm -hmm. and the size of the windows in both properties. Thank you for that clarification. It's very helpful that the distance is about 65 metres, but on a slightly sloping side. Yes. Thank you. Could, could I ask, um, that is why you're keen to have the hedge at the bottom? There That's is certain. a hedge at the bottom of the garden. We, yeah. have, we have a two metre boundary, yeah. a brick wall at the end of our property between us and the previous <laughs> neighbours and um, the hedge is now over four metres high. Um, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Put holly trees in the way, you know, we, we all want as much light nice. in our gardens. We all want to live a nice, comfortable life. And there wasn't the overlooking that we had before. So it is, it is quite distressing especially in the winter when we've got our lights on, we've got quite big windows as the new property has before there was no overlooking. Okay, thank you. I think we've got the point. Thank you very much. Um, we can we can look at the boundary treatments. Thank you. Any other questions of clarification members? No? Okay, thank you very much. You may return to your seats. If you could just, that's it. Perfect. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Councillor Rona Blundell from Oliver's Battery Parish Council, if you'd like to come forward. Councillor Blundell, you have three minutes when you're ready. Just switch on the microphone and the timer will start when you start speaking. The Parish Council believes its objection, which the committee will have seen, is valid on the basis that the application is an overdevelopment of the site and adversely affects neighbouring properties. The proposed development will have a detrimental effect on this area due to its density and bulk, making it overbearing out of scale relative to adjacent old dwellings. The implications are that the proposal will dominate adjacent dwellings, adversely affect affecting the residential amenity of neighbours by reason of overlooking, overshadowing, loss of privacy and loss of light. It is concerned that the 2022 permission was not adhered to and that building work continued despite a 2023 enforcement notice. Higher than other nearby dwellings, where developments upwards have added a second story and is much higher now than the photos on the site as the case officers has mentioned. 
Um, its single storey will extend the full width of the dwelling at the rear, with more of the building along adjacent boundaries, and the planned second storey appears to extend back, back further than that of the original dwelling. Other nearby developments appear to have either more space or a single storey garage between them. The report concerning this development acknowledges that this would result in overshadowing of number 114 in the afternoon and onwards. This would include a garden area. The Parish Council believes that this, this development will have an unacceptable and adverse and material impact on adjacent properties, does not comply with LPP2 policy DP16 and should be refused. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, do we have any questions of clarification for the Parish Council representative? No? OK, thank you very much. You may return to your seat. Thank you. And we now move to the ward councillor, Councillor Jan Warwick. Councillor Warwick, you have, as you know, five minutes. When you're ready, thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman. And I just wanted to thank members who attended the site visit on Monday morning. I know those of you that couldn't make Monday morning came along later in the day, so thank you so much. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address the committee today for the retrospective planning application at 116 Oliver's Battery Road South. Oliver's Battery, as you know, consists of a central core of two-storey houses surrounded by single-storey low-density bungalows and with open plan gardens. The proposed development sits on the edge of this central core between two single storey bungalows at 114 and 118 Oliver's Battery Road South. Local residents have raised objections to the increased roof height of the new building, which reaches 7.9 metres from the original 5.4 metre bungalow. They are concerned that the increased height, along with the bulk of the new structure, will dominate the street scene and have a detrimental effect on their properties. They fear that the additional height and new windows will impact their privacy and enjoyment of their homes. So I would draw members' attention to the risk of overlooking neighbouring properties and ask consideration of landscape screening options for all affected properties. The 2008 Oliver's Battery Village Design Statement states that the conversion or replacement of single storey dwellings with two storey dwellings should not be permitted if the resulting roof height and overall bulk dominate the street scene and negatively affect neighbouring properties. So I would urge the committee members to carefully consider this aspect under policy CP13 of the Winchester Local Plan, which emphasises the importance of new developments connecting seamlessly with the surrounding development in terms of layout, of scale and of space. Chairman, there's one issue of concern, and you will have noted this is a retrospective application following the original application last year, um, 00354. Concerns about the planning process followed in this case have been raised by residents, and it's important to understand why there were no comments or objections to the initial application, except from the Oliver's Battery Parish Council. Nearby residents, including those living at number 114 and 118, have stated that they were not notified of the original application in writing by the City Council last year and they say that no orange sign was displayed outside the property. So I'm just raising that with you. So they were unaware of proposals to replace the bungalow next door with a five bedroomed house until the applicant came around to notify them of their intentions to do some work in December 2022. So by this time, planning permission had already been granted. And given the number of concerned residents we now have, it is likely that local councillors would have called this original application to committee for a decision. Additionally, you will be aware that the three walls of the original structure were demolished due to safety concerns, and I don't fully understand the implications of a new build versus an extension other than the obvious saving on VAT, but it would be relevant to this application to have details of our own building controls written report on the condition of the remaining walls before they were demolished to understand why they could not be used or incorporated into the new construction. And finally, Chairman, um, in places, the pro close proximity of the new structure's walls to both neighbouring properties 
in places they are less than one metre away from the boundary, particularly of number 114. So I would kindly request the committee carefully consider as conditioning the inclusion of screening planting between all affected properties, yes, including those to the east. So thank you for your attention and consideration in evaluating these concerns and points of consideration. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Warwick. Members, do we have any questions of clarification? As you noted earlier on, we did all have the benefits, not only of visiting the site, but visiting the site when the roof is on, so we could see the actual impacts locally of the of the final, um, which, which we don't often get to see um, when we have um, planning applications in front of us. So thank you. And we have, we have, you know, all I think now have got a very clear idea of the, 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 the situation locally. Thank you very much. You may return to your seat. And our final contribution is from Louise Katz, who is a supporter. Thank you very much. So you have three minutes. And the time will start when you start speaking and you switch on the microphone by pressing the button. All right, thank you. When you're ready. Thank you, Chair. On the 10th of June last year, this local planning authority approved extensions to this dwelling that would have resulted in exactly the same development as is now being retrospectively applied for. So if the local planning authority considered that that, that development was acceptable, there would appear to be no valid or reasonable reason to refuse this application. The resulting dwelling was properly assessed then, as it has been now by your professional planning officer and her manager. Whilst the parish council expressed concerns to the previous application, not one local resident expressed concern at that point. Some suggest that they did not receive notification of the application, and that may be true when neighbours are not located immediately adjacent to the site, but the immediate neighbours did receive notification, as your records will no doubt demonstrate. And so any claims on that basis are incorrect. The reason for the building anew, as opposed to continuing with the approved extensions, was down to the advice from my client's builders and Winchester's own building regulations officers. The existing dwelling was so poorly constructed that the advice was to take the remaining walls down and rebuild. Necessitating this retrospective application, which was submitted immediately, the applicants knew that that's what they were going to do, my clients were certainly not expecting the quite vitriolic and personal objections that they have received to their application, especially when no neighbour objections have been previously received. Your officers have confirmed that there is no material difference in the plans between the approved extensions permission and the current application, and that what has been built also matches up to those plans. The resulting dwelling is better insulated, it's built to current building regulation standards, and therefore it's highly sustainable. And the hope is that the application can be approved. My clients are a large family of nine with seven children, two of which unfortunately have severe disabilities. Currently, the family are living with a mother-in-law. However, as you can imagine, hosting such a large family for so long is not without its difficulties. And my clients have also been having very many sleepless nights worrying about the level of objection to their new application. In short, my clients are absolutely desperate to move to their new home, which is nearly finished, and hope that members will allow them to do so. Um, in response to some of the issues that have been raised about uh, potential screening, my clients would be would be happy to accept conditions with regards to that. Lovely, thank you. Members, do we have any questions of Councillor Laming? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, Relative to the letter that you sent to us all and your stated bit that you're talking about the building controller called out to view the existing dwelling and agreed to the client's builder would be better to rebuild the walls to prevent further issues. Now, having a lot to do with um, building control over the last few years on various things, I asked them whether they gave the, that advice and they categorically deny giving that advice because it happens to be something that they would refer to their clients as uh, something that needed a proper surveyor to do the job. So uh, I'm a little bit of a loss why you come up at that point. Councillor Naming, I'm not entirely sure that that's a relevant planning consideration. Well, I mean, it, it might because, be something you're interested in, but I'm not sure that it's... No, but it is relevant to this because it is part of the application they had to do 
remove the walls because they weren't fit for structure. This this is a completely separate application and we're dealing with it as a completely new application. Yes. Yeah. And we are, you know, it is what it but is. It's retrospective. But are we dealing with it as a separate issue or are we dealing with it? Do you want to answer that question? Well, yes, firstly, that's untrue. So that's just a difference of opinion that members will have to make their minds up about. Um, but there are good reasons to show that their intention was never to do what they did. First of all, they've incurred a sill bill of £39,000, which they were not expecting. And um, your planning officers will, um, uh, you know, tell that the story in terms of us trying to kind of reduce that bill in some possible way, which we've not been able to do, so they will be paying that. And secondly, they spent about three or four weeks um, uh, implementing the extensions application, which they wouldn't have spent time and money on if they were going to simply just replace the building. So I hope Absolutely. Helps. Thank you very much. Chair, if I may, um, members, also someone's motive or the reasons as to why someone's intending to apply for a planning application is irrelevant to the fact that the application is with the local planning authority. You're not here to explore people's motives or their reasoning as to why they're submitting a planning application. The fact is you have a planning application and on all four corners you must decide that application. So we're not here to decide and interrogate a person's motive as to why they're applying. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Lucas. Right. I think that's absolutely clear. OK, thank you very much indeed for coming along and uh, you may return to your seat. Right. Catherine, uh, is there anything you wanted to add following your presentation and following the um, contributions from the public? Thank you. No, Chair, nothing further to add. Thank you. So now we move to questions to um, our presenting officer um, and we will take the whole report. Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the problem here seems to be really down to the density, the bulk and the height of this construction in the street scene. The topography of that road is quite interesting insofar as it runs from the from the current site down towards 120, 124, 128, etc. The ridge height of the proposed dwelling is 7.9 metres on the gable end and seven meters on the southern end, I believe. Now that being the case, what is it in regard, how is that in regard to the actual ridge height of 122 and 120 and 124, which is much lower in the street scene? Thank you, Chair. Um, the, uh, the main impact of the development is on the immediate neighbours. Um, you might have seen from further up, which is uh, 112. Um, get that photo on the screen. So the top uh, left hand photo, albeit this was taken before the roof was, was put on and it's um, higher up, slightly higher up than the site. Um, the, the views are that there are views of it, but they're not going to um, impact on any amenity. Um, further down the street, yes, the, the street does run downwards from north to south. Um, but the dwellings that you're talking about, one, two, two, one, uh, two, four, are of a sufficient distance that there won't be any overbearing uh, or other um, neighbour impact. No, I'm really I'm really referring to the precedent set by the ridge height of 124 and 120 in relation to the proposed dwelling. Uh, is it significantly higher? But you see, because of the height of the proposed dwelling, it will sit more prominently in the street scene. And that, that therefore probably is you know, causing the problem with bulk height and mass. Thank you, Chair. I don't have the heights of of those um, properties to hand. Uh, what I would say is that as the um, those two new house, recently built houses at 122 and 124 um, were looked at um, in consideration to the street scene, they stepped down um, following the um, 
following the contours um, and this building, albeit it's between two bungalows, uh, when you look at the wider street scene, um, it follows that sort of prevailing form of, of development with the with the uh, respecting the slope of, of the site and the street. Thank you. OK, I have a few questions about the boundary treatments. Now, we've got a condition um, to ask about boundary treatments. Um, I'm assuming that the fencing on either side where the current scaffolding is, is going to be reinstated and that will deal with overlooking from ground floor windows. <clears throat> um, and the, the neighbour opposite in terms of at the other end of the garden was concerned about overlooking from first floor windows. Um, <clears throat> and is it possible to condition the hedge as she requested, or is that unreasonable? Thank you, Chair. Um, the boundary with 30 Compton Way, which is to the rear, um, we wouldn't be able, it's not reasonable to expect a, a new hedge to be planted there. But the side boundaries with 114118, um, I believe the fencing is to be reinstated, but um, the uh, condition number nine, I think it is, um, with, regarding the um, hard and soft boundary treatment, that would give um, uh, members um, and, and a scope to um, look at a more detailed landscaping scheme, which would include the uh, any soft landscaping as well as the reinstated um, uh, fences. And talking about um, trees and so on, I understand that the um, the silver birch at the front are going to be protected when the garage, which hasn't been started yet, is built. Is that correct? Yes, Chair, that's correct. Um, I think I don't think it's. Uh, there's a specific condition that covers that, but we could, um, if members were minded to approve, um, add that to condition nine um, to require that tree to be protected during the construction of the garage um, uh, so that tree is retained. And finally, um, the roof lights. There's some concern about overlooking from the roof lights um, upstairs now they're going to be they're going to be um obscure glazed but they presumably will be opening is it possible to condition that they should open at the top only so that instead of opening at the bottom that the top is opening so that there's no possibility of any overlooking from those windows uh, thank you chair they're not going to be obscure glazed um the height and um the applicant has provided this uh, drawing, which um, gives an idea of the um, eye level um, 1.7 um, meter high level eye level, which is just under six foot um, in uh, in sort of uh, imperial terms, um, where the um, where, where the sight line out of those windows would be. Um, it would be um, very limited um, and the assessment has actually looked into whether or not obscure glazing would be um, it is necessary um, and uh, given the sight lines from the windows it's very unlikely there would be views however um, the applicant is happy to um, restrict them to top opening only so they wouldn't be able to be open from the bottom. Um, uh, so hopefully that that um, would um, mitigate any overlooking further. Good. So let's put in that condition then. Um, any more questions? Yes, Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Catherine, as the height of these buildings has been raised, can I look at the three precedents that are actually in your report where in 19, uh, number 120, 122 and 124, which are near neighbours of this site, all have had changes 
which included raising the height of the roof. Now, how does the, the height of their roofs, this may be unfair if it does say so, compare with this one? Because Planning inspectors are going to look at that near neighbours. You know, it's not so out of character. Uh, can you tell us so uh, how the height of the height of this building compares with those other three, which Thank are you. the old neighbours, 120, 122, and 124? Thank you, Chair. I think Councillor Cunningham might have asked a similar question. Um, I don't have the heights of those buildings, um, but as I said, um, the, um, as you know, the, the road slopes down from north sure. to south, a gentle slope. Um, the, the proposed building has been assessed in terms of its impact on the surrounding street scene, and it's not um, considered to be um, so high that it would um, harm the character of that street scene. Um, so, in uh, you know, as I've um, assessed that uh, visual impact in relation to the other new property or well, newish properties that have been built is acceptable. Yeah, uh, just we looked, well I looked, um, when we were on the gar in the garden of 118 at 120, what you could see of it, uh, because there was a, what they've done at the back of that house, very similar to what is proposed for 116, and indeed was passed in uh, 22. Um, similar fascia, wooden fascia, um, flat roof, seems to be similar height to what is what uh, in 116. Am I correct in that assumption? Uh, thank you, Chair. I don't, as I say, I don't have the measurements, but I think yeah, it probably is a quite similar height um, to those and similar impact on the on the street scene. Yeah. Well, that was my conclusion as well, but I wanted you to, if you were aware of the those press buggy, you must have been because you're on the spot. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Pearson. I think we've made that point that in the wider street scene, there are similar examples. OK. Uh, Councillor Laming, you have a question. Thank you. Um, on sustainability, we're saying that we would like the development to achieve level five um, for energy and level four for water. Yet in conditions seven, we're only asking for level four. Can we change that to level five, please? Uh, thank you, Jess. I'm sorry, Councillor Lane, I didn't quite catch all of that. Could you? He was asking if um, yeah. so the, the, the applicants have said they're going to build to, to level five, oh, right. and, and we're only conditioning level four. Can you explain that? Yes. Um, so um, level four, I, I think it was a few uh, a few years ago, the government um, accepted that uh, whilst we should uh, try and achieve the highest level of energy efficiency, which is level five, um, that it's it's not always it's a very high test to meet. It's not always possible to achieve that. So our condition that we use. Um, requires um, that if they can build to level five, which they which they are um, to do, um, that that's the that the the you know the highest um, uh, test to meet. But if that's not possible, then it should meet. It should be no low no lower than level four for um, uh, energy and water efficiency. Yes, but this is a new build, we're told. So I think, Councillor Laming, we've been told that the government say we're not allowed to condition above level four. So well, other councils that's do. That. Well, that's what yeah, It's to... quite enforceable if we wish to, because we say that in our uh, policy, but we prefer that to that. Uh, I, I just, I, what I could say is I think that there's other mechanisms outside of planning that are actually, like building control, I think they've got new legislation brought in recently that does require higher and higher which the applicants will have to be building to. Our policies are, have not caught up with that um, for, for many years. And obviously in our new local plan, that's where um, we will be looking at that in more detail. So it's 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 really not something that the planning um, mechanisms are needing to control at this moment because building control regs will. So that's covered by building control, Councillor Lane. Any more questions? 
No? Okay. Debate. Councillor Laming. I think this raises a lot of questions um, and it is causing an impact on the actual uh, area that is being developed. So I feel that it is a very large building on a fairly small plot and it's dominating the houses on either side. Um, so therefore, I should be listening to what everybody else says, but I'm considering uh, not, go, not approving this one. Uh, the contributions, Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chair. It's very difficult when uh, considering an application when the building is already there. And to answer that question is, it's an, the result of an application that was made uh, a year ago and passed. That's buildings taking place, as I understand it, from the site committee, the only difference between what was passed in 1920, uh, sorry, 2022 and today is a small window by the door into the utility room has been omitted. Um, the rest of it is what is passed in 2022. Now, if it was OK then, and I understand the objector saying, well, we weren't informed, uh, I'm afraid that's not an issue we can deal with at this point. The point is, it's, it was passed and it is 90% complete. So it'd be rather perverse to say, oh, pull it all down and resubmit, because effectively that is what we're being asked to say. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't go along with that. I was on the site visit. And whether what does, I wasn't, I don't recall it going through the planning commission in 22. In fact, I think it was delegated to officers. Um, what our decision would have been at that time, I have no idea. We're here and now, we're looking at a 90% complete building, and that has been passed. Looking again, I think it'd be rather perverse for us now to suddenly turn out, no, sorry, planning inspector would look at the street scene quoted three precedents of near neighbours where the roof has been raised. Uh, yes, it's a different design, um, but OK, it's a different design. We're looking at the climate emergency. Designs are different. That's reality. So thank you for the report, Catherine, and thank you for the neighbours allowing us to go onto your site um, to look at this building. Um, that was very helpful. Thank you. So I, I, I regret, well, not regret, I have to say that I agree with uh, Catherine's conclusions that uh, we give this permission to carry on and be completed and, well, that we are where we are. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. I'd like to say just a few words. Um, we have looked at this as a completely separate new application, and that's what the report has done, and that's what our officer has done. And I have to say that we've looked at this very thoroughly and had a pre-meeting um, site visit so that we were all clear about how this new building sits within the wider street scene as well as the impact on the near neighbours. And whilst inevitably there is some impact on near neighbours, I think that most of that can be mitigated by boundary treatments and uh, other things that we have agreed conditions on. Um, as it as as a new build, um, as Councillor Pearson says, we have to take account of the climate emergency and I'm very pleased and welcome the fact that they, the applicants are building it to as high um, a sustainability level as they can. And, um, and whilst it is very different from the previous bungalow, I think it's going to be an attractive addition to the wider street scene. Most of the buildings in that road are built right up to the boundaries or virtually within a metre of them, and that's not unusual in that area. Um, so I think that we have thoroughly looked at this and are also certainly thoroughly looked at this. And actually, I think it's a benefit in some ways that we <laughs> actually had a look at the final building so that we can actually see what it is like uh, and its actual impact rather than having to imagine it 
um, from plants, which is always a bit of a difficult thing to do. So whilst I do understand and have sympathy for the neighbours, um, there is, I think that the impact of this new building is is not unreasonable and it's not something that would um, give us the reason to reject this application. Um, OK, any any other contributions from members? Councillor Gordon Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, we, we, we have the benefit of looking at it on site. Um, there seem to be a few pertinent things um, in terms of overlook. The existing bungalow now demolished had a dormer window at the back. So I don't think the question of overlooking of adjacent properties uh, has has suddenly appeared. It's all it's that 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 has always existed. Granted, the building's taller and there's two windows at the back rather than one. But I don't think really materially the overlooking issue is that critical. I mean, like other characters, I'm slightly baffled that the original application didn't raise any objections. Uh, the parish council brought up the issue of unsuitable materials. In the, as a comment on the exist as an objection in the, uh, the previous application, but actually the materials that have been used occur in the area already. Pine uh, timber cladding, uh, metal fascias, and the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> then got the issue of the bulk of the building. And of course, one of the problems is, as we know, there's a state of flux all the way through Oliver's battery. We had a case uh, a month ago with newer buildings coming up and then the argument, does it affect the street scene or doesn't it affect the street scene? And again, in this case, it, on the corner, the other side, there's two storey buildings. Uh, there's other houses in the street that we've seen that have had extension, have the roof, uh, had the ridge uh, raised and dormers and so on. So I, unfortunately, the village design statement is rather, it's a rather wordy and not very well defined. Um, and I can see no good reason to refuse this application. So I would be with the officer for approving it. OK, well, if there's no more debate, we will move to the decision. So this application is recommended for approval. Can I see all those in favour of approval, please? I believe that's all members. Yes, nine unanimous, Chair. OK, thank you very much indeed. That application is approved. Thank you very much. We will now take a uh, break for a cup of coffee and we will return at okay. 11 o'clock. Thank you very much.
OK, welcome back to the planning committee. Uh, we're now at item number eight on your agendas. Uh, this is the Aldi food store at 2 Burnett Close, Winchester. And this is an application to uh, change a condition. So uh, the officer presenting is uh, Sean Quigley. Welcome, Sean. If you'd like to give us your presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you said, this is an application for a change of an existing condition which uh, limits the delivery arrangements at the Audi store in week. Um, there's the uh, outline of the site in week on that first slide. There's an aerial uh, photograph of the Audi store showing the car park and Waitrose to the south and residential development around its boundaries. That's a view from Stockbridge Road with Burnett Close showing the vehicular and pedestrian access to the Audi store. This, this, is, this is just reminding us of the application. The key part is the change, the extension of the delivery hours on Sundays and bank holidays from eight o'clock in the morning, finishing at four o'clock pushing that four o'clock back to seven o'clock. So it's an additional three hours on Sundays and bank holidays for deliveries to be accepted at the store. Uh, and I should say at this point, Chair, there's, there's no implication that it's additional deliveries. It's just a, a, a wider window for the deliveries. And the application is proposed, recommended to be approved. Thank you. Thank you, very succinct. OK, we now move to public speaking and um, we have one objector, Graham Matthews, and I think you have a PowerPoint presentation as well. How exciting. You have three minutes. The timer will start when you start speaking and if you can switch on the microphone using the button at the bottom of the microphone when you're ready. Thank you. We've got a split screen with the timer on. Yeah. I think can members see it? OK, good morning. <clears throat> Audi's previous planning application to change the delivery times resulted in 50 objections from residents. And unfortunately, during this consultation, there was no orange sign placed by the store. And so only a few residents have had the opportunity to voice their concerns, although I'm grateful to have a few minutes now. And as you can see from this picture, residents live very close to the loading bay and are subjected to noise from the lorries unloading. The acoustic engineer working for Aldi describes this as clearly perceptible impulsivity from bangs and crashes of unloading activity. Now, I can't play you an audio recording, but I'd like to show you a graph on the next slide from a previous Aldi noise survey, which shows the level of the noise levels over a one hour delivery window. And as you can see, the disturbance is not just attributed to the sound of the lorry arriving on the left and departing on the right of the graph. There are 40 or so spikes across the hour, and that is due to the pallets as they scrape down the side of the lorry. And as the wheels hit the metal leveling gate, bang, bang. This is not a quiet operation. In Aldi's quiet delivery scheme on the next slide, they claim or they argue that their dock mechanism, in quotes, contains noise within the building and trailer. They cannot claim this. This is simply not true. And on the contrary, the bangs and crashes from unloading activity impacts the behavior of residents who live nearby. It prevents young kids getting to sleep. It makes conversations difficult or people avoid sitting in the garden and results in people closing windows, especially in the summer. And as this impacts behavior, according to the MPPF, the National Policy Framework, this is described as significant adverse impact. So on that point, I disagree with the case officer's report. Another disturbance not mentioned in the scheme is the noisy diesel engine uh, that runs constantly when the lorry is delivering frozen goods. And it's even worse if the lorry gets stuck and you know in the car park waiting 
due to the lo loading bay being blocked by cars. And the drivers say they cannot switch that off. Aldi has a poor track record of sticking to the current planning conditions and residents have complained many times and you'll see that on the cases. The council enforcement team has been involved back in 21 due to 6 a.m. deliveries. So in short, Aldi cannot be trusted. Our Sunday trading laws are there for a reason. That is to designate Sunday as a quieter day and residents appreciate this quieter time from 4 p.m. So in summary, I urge you not to entrust Aldi with this additional flexibility. It will not increase stock to the store and simply extend, extends disruption to residents without reason. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect timing. Now, please wait. We may have some questions for you. Thank you. So, members, do we have questions of clarification? Councillor Cunningham. Thank you very much for your presentation. <clears throat> you stated that the delivery times seem to be around about 6 a.m. in the morning. I'd be interested to know what time the deliveries do come Monday to, so Monday to Friday and then again on Sundays and bank holidays. If you could help me out, please. The delivery times in the morning are 7 a.m. and in, in the recent years, Aldi has been sticking to that. My point is, is that back in 21, I spent two or three months working with the MP and the council enforcement team to stop them delivering at 6 a.m. And my point is, is that they're not very good at sticking to the times. I mean, even a week ago on Sunday, they delivered at 8 p.m. on Sunday outside of the restrictions. So on Sundays, is that was that a one off or is it regularly on Sundays? They, they the area manager told me that was a one off, but the point being over the 10 years, they've not been very good at sticking to the current restrictions. OK, thank you very much. Can I ask um, how long it takes for them to unload one of the big lorries? One hour. And there's two a day and sometimes there's an extra milk delivery as well. So it's so normally three, three lorries. So each HGV that arrives takes an hour to unload. Assuming it doesn't get stuck in the car park for half an hour, yes. OK. Councillor Cunningham again. Sorry, did you say that there was also a middle delivery as well as the six or seven o'clock in the morning delivery? So they normally deliver at 7 a.m. That takes an hour. There's normally a milk delivery that happens about 11 a.m. And then there's a subsequent delivery that happens later in the day, which can be right in the evening or the afternoon. It varies. Is that an Aldi delivery? Or yes. So there's another second delivery during the day at some stage as well. That's not an Aldi lorry. That's a big milk lorry that comes in. Yeah. Sorry, it is or it isn't an Aldi delivery. I, I think it's not an Aldi branded lorry, but it is still a delivery to the store. OK, thank you very much. No more questions? Oh yes, Councillor Warden smith um, Two questions. Do they also reload the truck with empty stuff? Yes, to be recycled or whatever. OK, fine. And tell me, the pallets that they use, are they like a sort of metal cage on wheels? Exactly. Right, thank you. Yep, Councillor Edwards. And can you describe a little more from your observations how contained the rear of the truck is within the building when the unloading is taking place? Or, you know, are the pallets going through the open air, as it were, before they reach the building bay? It's a good question. So you, you don't see the pallets, and I guess that's why Aldi's arguing that it's contained within the building and the trailer. But the point is, it's very noisy. Those decibels on that graph clearly show you the noise levels associated with that. And so, you know, it's the noise that's the disturbance, right? OK, I think that's all. Thank you very much indeed. You may return to your seat. You. If you could switch off the mics, that's great. OK, um, we now have the ward councillor, Councillor Johnny Morris. If you'd like to come forward, Councillor Morris. You have five minutes and uh, the timer will start when you start speaking. Thank you. Uh, I would like to speak in support of the additional condition, or which you'll find included on page six of the update sheet uh, regarding the um, condition of an installation of an electrical power supply for the lorries to use for refrigeration purposes. Uh, 
I, this additional condition is necessary because according to the public comment submitted by Mr. Craig Matthews, Audi are currently unable to comply with conditions set out in the existing quiet delivery scheme, which is that the drivers will use a power supply from the store to provide power if necessary. And so if they, according to his submission, they are unable to do this due to the lack of an external power supply. Uh, therefore, this condition is to ensure that if the planning application is approved, it is on the basis that Audi will install and operate an electrical supply so that they can fully comply with the existing quiet delivery scheme. Uh, it is also to specify that the engine which is specifically powering the refrigeration unit is switched off and not just the engine which is powering the vehicle. Uh, I would also add that the installation and operation of this facility would help mitigate the issues of noise and air pollution, not just during the extra hours requested, but at all other times when deliveries are made during the week and other times of the day. Uh, so I recommend that if planning permission is given, it is with the inclusion of this additional condition. Uh, it is my understanding that Audi have already agreed to install and operate such a power supply, but I recommend it be included nevertheless uh, for reasons of future enforcement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Morris. Um, if you'd like to just wait, Councillor Laming has a question. You say that the refrigeration unit is being on all the time, which I understand fully. But when the vehicle is unloading, is it not plugged in to an external supply so that the main engine is not running off the truck? Uh, my understanding from uh, Mr. Matthews is that it is not. Uh, it, it, may, it continues to use a diesel supply because the lorries that Audi use do not have uh, the facilities to use an electrical supply at the moment. So the introduction of this condition would mean that Audi would then have to use lorries which also have this facility. All right, thank you. No other questions? I think this is your first planning committee, isn't it? Yes. So welcome and well done and thank you very much. You may return to your seat. Thank you. OK, and our final speaker is an Audi representative, Alan Williams. Welcome, Mr. Williams. And uh, you have three minutes, which will start when you start speaking. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Alan Williams and act as the planning agent on behalf of Aldi Stores Limited. This application proposes an extension to the permitted delivery hours on Sundays and bank holidays by only three hours from four till seven. A combination of conditions 17 and 18 of the original planning permission for the Audi store mean it is currently very difficult for produce to be to be at the store ready for the next day as deliveries are not permitted when the store is open and the store closes at 4 p.m. on a Sunday which coincides with the current delivery restriction. Audi require greater flexibility for when deliveries can take place on Sundays and bank holidays to ensure the store meets customer demand and shelves are well stocked. Particularly as Aldi accepts that deliveries by articulated lorry still cannot take place while the store is open for business. Furthermore, the extended delivery times will minimise any conflict between parked cars and articulated vehicles, as the car park is likely to have been largely vacated by, um, by at the time a delivery is scheduled to take place. It will also avoid peak times on the road network. The number and types of delivery per day should remain unaltered by this application. It provides greater flexibility for existing deliveries, not scope for additional deliveries. We welcome the planning officer's recommendation for approval of this application and the acceptance by the environmental health and highways officers. An up to date noise survey was carried out to support the application, which demonstrates that the proposal will not give rise to a significant adverse impact on the con in the context of the relevant standards and guidance. The env environmental health officer has no objection. A quiet delivery scheme was submitted with the application and Aldi accepts the suggested condition that requires deliveries to be carried out in accordance with that quiet delivery scheme. 
We also note that an additional condition has been recommended, which requires an electrical supply to be installed in the service bay area for delivery vehicles to be connected within two months of any planning permission. This will allow the vehicle's engine that powers the refrigeration unit to be turned off in accordance with the quiet delivery scheme. Aldi has confirmed that they accept this condition and would install electrical supply for delivery vehicles, which will further assist in minimising noise impact. Based on the consideration of the proposal, including the need and benefits of the additional hours, the findings of the environmental noise assessment and that demonstrates that will not give rise to significant adverse impact, as agreed by the Council's advisor, and the support and recommendation by officers, we consider this is a clear case where the benefits are such that planning permission should be granted. I therefore urge you to follow the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, do we have any questions of clarification? Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the objector um, suggested that noise was a major issue as on the number of vehicles to a day. Um, how do you deal with noise complaints? I mean, quite clearly, movement of empty pilots going around as, as workers tend to do. Uh, how do you deal with those complaints? I mean, just to be clear, I, I'm, I'm not actually out of themselves, I'm only their, their, their consultant, but I understand that, um, as the objector has said, that there were discussions in 2021 regarding um, uh, noise uh, complaints in the store and potentially vehicles um, turning up or, or leaving um, slightly outside of the hours. And my understanding is that, you know, those have been taken seriously and that there haven't been any issues uh, following those those complaints and that lorries have stuck to the, the times that they were meant to. And the trucks when they come in, oh, sorry, lorries when they come in, they're fully loaded or do they sometimes come in with only one pallet? Well, I mean, that they're part of a delivery schedule for, for, for stores, various yeah. stores on the route. So it will depend on where this particular store is on that route, whether it's the first one the lorry might be full. OK, and if it's the last store, then then there might not be too much in there. OK, thank you very much. Um, if I could ask um, about the quiet delivery scheme. Can you just reassure the residents that you will that that will actually impact on the the noise that currently they're hearing from the delivery lorries and that it will reduce that amount of noise. And can you just tell me how how that changes what is the normal routine? Yeah, I think I mean clearly deliveries are always a sensitive subject on on a, on a slide, yeah. and th there will yeah. always be some noise from that. You know, it, it's just the nature, unfortunately. But I think the quiet delivery scheme it puts in measures, you know, such as the electrical supply, so that the diesel engine can be turned off and the the hum of the, you know, the refrigeration uh, would would therefore or be minimised. It, it, you know, some of it you might say is common sense, but it ensures that you know there isn't, you know, loud noises of in, the radios turned off. That you know, just the best practice for that delivery to take place so that unnecessary noise impacts can be um, minimised as much as possible. So is the training of, of the employees about this, still, you know, that it's very clear that this is something that they need to stick yeah. to and they need to concentrate on not bashing the sides yeah, of the lorry, that sort of thing? Yeah, the, I mean, the proximity of residents to this store is, isn't uncommon in, in, the, in the Audi portfolio. So these sorts of issues are, are well known. So the drivers and the delivery staff are getting are trained on these quiet delivery schemes and, and are aware of which stores those are, you know, are in place. And likewise, the staff at the store and the store manager will, you know, clearly ensure that that's adhered to. Thank you. Well, as, as you, um, I'm sure, are aware and can pass on, the, the residents will be listening out for a sure. marked improvement in the noise levels em emanating from the deliveries. More questions? Any more questions? Councillor Cunningham and then Councillor Laney. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Sir, are you aware of the current opening hours and closing times of the store? Um, yes, so on on Sundays, uh, the store is open from 10 till 4. And on bank holidays? Bank holidays, I, I don't actually have that to hand, but I think um, it's it's a slightly reduced compared to the normal, but um, it's it's longer than on Sundays, so it's approximately 
eight to yeah. ten maximum. Can I help you out? Can yeah. I help you out? You know, Sundays are ten a.m. to four p.m. Yeah. Bank holidays are eight a.m. to eight p.m. This is a photograph of your. Okay. Now, that being the case, you've extended your opening hours on bank holidays from four p.m. to eight p.m. That basically means <clears throat> that both in terms of your current permitted HGV delivery time of 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and requested delivery time of 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. You may know you may not have any HTV delivery movements on the bank holiday. Be aware of that. I'm aware of that. And the the, key, the real critical I mean, it's the way the wording is conditioned that Sundays and bank holidays are, are grouped together. Um, hence, hence the variation of the hours. That Sunday is the critical thing because they happen every single week. Whereas bank holidays, there aren't awfully many during the year, and so Aldi can kind of accept that compromise. But the, the real thing is getting that produce ready at the store for them for Monday morning when it's not a bank. Sorry, when it's not a bank holiday. We've heard from one of the objectors that the problem is that you're not able to stick with the timings that are currently permitted, let alone those that you're going to be asking to, to do now. I would think that uh, 7 p.m. on the Sunday is going a bit too far in my book, but we'll see, we'll see with the debate anyway. So is that a question or is it a statement? Sorry. No, my concern was the fact that you you would probably not be able to finish the delivery by 7 p.m. Well, I think if it takes an hour to do the delivery, is that correct? It, it does. So so clearly, you know, and Aldi's got an additional two hours for a vehicle to turn up before, you know, and then and get the delivery uh, done by 7 p.m. So um, it, it adds to that flexibility to to ensure that, you know, the hours can be stuck, you know, to. The, 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 the key thing at the moment is that an hour, the deliveries can't happen at, during the opening hours and so 4 p.m. as the store closes, no more deliveries on a Sunday. That's the, that's the issue. That is correct at the moment. Yeah. All right, thank you, Councillor Cunningham. I think you've made your point, Councillor Laming. Yes, I'm, firstly, I was amazed to find out that you didn't have electrical connection. Councillor Laming, I'm finding it very difficult to hear what you're saying. Do you think you could speak up yeah. more clearly and into the microphone? Thank you. Yeah, I find it quite amazing that there are not electrical connection there already for the vehicles, considering what you're delivering. Um, have you considered putting any sound deadening equipment around the lorry? Because it's very exposed uh, towards the residents where the parking bay where the unloading bay is, so coming out from the building a bit more because there are ways of uh, absorbing the sound a bit more, being kind to your neighbours. And I'm also concerned that if you say that you want to deliver up to a certain time, it takes an hour. So I think that uh, I would prefer to see the condition saying that finished load, unloading and loading by a certain time. In terms of your first point, um, you know, clearly we we have considered the uh, the delivery operation and, and the noise that's coming from that. You know, Aldi's noise advisors, as stated within the report that was submitted, is that the noise emanating from the delivery is considered acceptable as agreed by the environmental health officer. So, you know, our our, our opinion is that further mitigation is therefore not required. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Gordon Smith. Uh, Yes, uh, I don't know whether you can answer this, but I was wondering about the relationship between the haulage company, uh, uh, the haulage section of Aldi and the shop. And I understand there's a, a milk delivery midday. The reason I ask is that um, obviously there's this quiet working and so on, but very often it's a different department that's responsible for transportation and the links between the two don't work terribly well so with the best intentions to control noise and so on the message doesn't quite get through to the drivers yeah i, I understand that point um the the distribution center for this store is in swindon um which is where the head office is for this region um and i can only you know say you know my client is based in that in that office 
he assures me that these delivery schemes are passed on to that team um, and the drivers are made, made aware of them, including the, you know, the company that does the milk uh, delivery as well. So I, I can't really sort of say any more, more than that, really, um, that, that it, is, it is well known within the, within the company and those that have to carry out deliveries. Thank you. Perhaps you could just pass on our concerns that properly trained employees are used throughout. That sure. might be helpful. Councillor Wallace. Yeah, hi. Uh, we heard uh, it's part of the client delivery scheme of plan to put in this electrical power supply. Uh, can you confirm uh, are all of the Aldi delivery lorries capable of using that supply? Um, I, I can't answer whether every single one of them are. I know that these these the power supply is used at other stores within the region so um and i have seen that that take place so there must be vehicles within the fleet that can can therefore accommodate that and therefore um if they all can't be plugged in then they're going to have to ensure yeah. that the vehicle that comes to this store store um is one that is capable of being plugged in because clearly that's what the condition requires indeed Thank you very much. Any more questions of our representative of Aldi? No? Thank you very much indeed for coming along. If you'd like to return to your seat. Right. OK, that's the end of our public participation. Um, Sean, did you have anything to add? Only to say, Chair, that the, the general point that, that the Council don't don't deny the idea that there will be increased disturbance. It's an assessment of whether that disturbance justifies the refusal of planning permission. We consider it don't. It doesn't take into account the special advice of the environmental protection officer. Thank you. OK, members, we will take questions on the whole report. Um, Councillor Peer. Yes, questions of Sean on the whole report. Did you have one, Councillor Pearson? Uh, Sean, uh, clearly noise is the big issue. Two lorries a day, bad enough, particularly when linked with air quality, outside the air quality zone. Now, I'm reading where you've written neighbourhood amenity, and you've got three paragraphs there. The, um, the noise assessment submitted with the application demonstrates context of national recognised standards. Now, what does our scientific officer say about those national recognised standards? I mean, are they excessive? Are they higher than we would have? Uh, lower than we would set? What are they in relation to? We set the standard within Winchester. National standards are guidance. So, what actually is there behind this that you've not written down? Unfortunately, I'm not able to answer that level of technical detail. Uh, I can only say that I'm, I'm, ha you know, I take the advice of the of um, the environmental protection officer, and his professional assessment is that taking into account yeah. the points you've raised, that his conclusion is, as he's advised, that yeah. he has no objection. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Uh, Chair, I, I'm very, I've been around uh, the pop concerts measuring noise there. Very, very difficult to measure intermittent noise, less of sound. So, you know, I look on the ground for the degree of suspicion. A, what level of sound was it? I couldn't read on the X or Y axis. Um, I mean, noise as I'm speaking in this room, and I, OK, to amplify what I'm saying is about 56 decibels. The noise people are complaining about, and I would the pallets will be removed from the lorry by a forklift truck. So that wouldn't necessarily make noise. It's the banging of pallets when they're empty and thrown around, which workmen tend to do. Uh, yeah, that's the issue, and it's very, very difficult for science officers to measure this. So I'm just wondering here, you know, there is a noise policy that don't we have, but how are we going to check on that? That policy has been followed. Well, it's the usual question about any of our conditions, Councillor Pierce, and we do rely yeah. on local people to inform us if the conditions are not being met. Yeah, yeah. 
and uh, and then enforcement comes in. And we, I think, we're sending a very clear message to Aldi that their employees should be properly trained and that there should be suitable signage around the, the delivery area and so on, that noise is an issue locally and that they should be very con conscious of that and minimise the amount of noise that they create. And we are very, res very restricting about the hours of delivery and so on and the number of deliveries and, and Aldi are accepting that and working within it. But have we had a lot of complaints already or is this? Well, no, I think, I think you know, we, we heard from the local resident that, that the last complaint was in 2021 and in fact those delivery hours were then adhered to within the conditions. Yeah. So whilst there is at the moment a lot more noise, I think that the quiet delivery scheme is going to be implemented. Um, and we have reassurance from Aldi that there will be training and there will be quite a lot of, you know, that they're doing as much as they can. And I think that we will rely, I'm sorry you can't speak again, we will rely on the residents to inform us if, if this does not improve. Um, so I think that's as much as we as a planning authority can do. Sure. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wallace, you have a question. Yeah, a couple of questions around just making sure that the conditions are um, uh, are comprehensive enough. Um, I think we've heard a couple of times that um, on the quiet delivery scheme that uh, the uh, electric, you know, the, uh, the the lorries will be plugged in and use electrical power. I'm just nervous about whether that I'd just like to ask the officer if he thinks the condition is comprehensive enough to capture that. Um, uh, the wording in particular is uh, the refrigeration unit can be turned off for the duration of the delivery. Um, do we think that wording is strong enough or is it captured in condition six? I'm I just don't want us to go to the effort of putting in, uh, you know, uh, getting this electrical point there and it not. Perhaps be we used. can replace can with will. Or Is should. that reasonable? Will be turned off. Can we do that? At the moment, Chair, it says shall. Shall be installed and that, that shall also applies to. Yes, yeah, shall be installed and it doesn't, it doesn't, it then says can be connected rather than will be connected. So whilst the it's sorry. Well, I think it would be better to use language that is less ambiguous than can be turned off. That's what we normally want to see in our conditions. So it was um, precise and enforceable. Um, and so I would recommend that it should say shall be turned off because there's no point having it and then it becomes a condition that's unnecessary. So yes, I do agree with that. So it shall be turned off. So we agree that that condition be amended to um, stronger wording. Yes, Councillor Wallace. Uh, and the second one was around the uh, delivery times. Uh, just some clarification that we say um, no delivery should be taken between certain hours. Um, does it need? Do we need to clarify that that means completion of delivery? Um, it doesn't just mean the lorry arriving. It means that it's unloaded and everything is completed by those times. These conditions are originally from the planning inspectorate's approval and so we're following the same line of language that the inspector used which would normally be good practice. My understanding is that it's we're primarily focused on the uh, arrival times there because it's an un, it's not a measurable amount of time that there could be to take to take for a delivery to be undertaken. So if you're trying to enforce a condition, you can see when the when the deliveries are, are arriving, um, it says and then they're dispatched on the site. Obviously, that's going out. So I would think it'd be quite difficult to add in something extra that said that they should, or, you know, what does that mean? Was it include everything finished and completed? Because the vehicle could still be on site, but the delivering of the goods could be completed. So I think it becomes getting into the sort of difficult territory there. So it's normally the sort of arrival point. That's my understanding. The, then do we need to consider reducing the hours on Sunday so it is completed by seven o'clock? It's not what the application is for. It's, 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 it's the previous application was there to 
they wanted to extend every single day the hours really quite late because they were having the difficulty so this is now just that one Sunday as a compromise that we've tried to sort of work with them on so we think that's a, a that the recommendation based on the noise assessment that's looked at that period where they're delivering is that sort of a reasonable compromise. It's quite a significant compromise just to give those extra few hours there. OK, we've heard our officers um, wait on that. Councillor Cunning, we have another question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Lorna said that basically the issue is, is one of, of uh, an HGV being able to arrive at one minute to seven under the proposed opening delivery hours. Now, because it would take an hour to complete, that would mean that the completion would not be until one minute to eight o'clock. I think so, that would be pushing the conditions unreasonably. But, it's re but, it, is, but it is agreed in the, in the detail of the application. If it goes to seven o'clock arrival, up to seven o'clock arrival, then that is the case. My thoughts are that that if we should be looking at perhaps reducing the permitted develop delivery hours to 6 p.m. in order to overcome that. It's reasonable. Chair, the, the hours are there and then the rest of the management of how the deliveries are undertaken is through the, the, the quiet delivery plan. So those two things working together, that's the mitigation and that's the controls for this. The, they've applied for um, the extended hours um, and so it's quite a material change if we were to reduce it further. I don't think that would be reasonable for the committee. We're not in the habit of trying to sort of negotiate the terms of the permission at the planning committee. So just to reiterate, it's it's difficult to control. Once we can see when deliveries are arriving on site, it's quite difficult to control when they're leaving on site. But the, the what they're doing on site and when they're completing should is managed through the, the delivery management of the scheme. And if we were then to suspect, well, there was reports that they were hanging around for hours and hours and hours later with unacceptable noise, then we, we would get complaints for that and we would be able to deal with that then. I think that would be outside the spirit of the permission that we are giving that they should carry on significantly over those hours. Um, so I I think it's unreasonable to do anything other than what we've got here. And I think anything exceptional outside that would be a matter of, of enforcement on our part. So I, I don't think I don't think it would be reasonable to restrict, would further restrict those hours. Let's see how we go. Okay. Okay, Chair, thank you for thank that. Thank you very I hope, much. I, I hope the objector has listened to the. Yes, I'm sure that words. the representative of Aldi is taking due note of all our comments. Right. Are there any other questions, members of our officer? No. Debate. Councillor Pearson. I, I understand what the uh, resident representative is suggesting about the noise factor and pallets are thrown around. They do tend to be noise. I mean, they're quite solid, heavy, and I can understand to a degree workers occasionally dropping a pallet in the right place. It happens, it's human nature. Uh, the timing of delivery is a difficult one. Uh, and indeed, the hours of delivery. I, I'm reminded that a planning inspector made a judgment about noise coming from tennis courts opposite me and su suggested that floodlights, for example, should not be on after nine o'clock because the residents had the right of peace and quiet after nine o'clock. Mind you, I'm in a rural area, slightly different. The other thing that concerns me is are we going to be imposing something on? Aldi that does not apply to the supermarket next door. If we do, that decision might be deemed unacceptable because it puts limitation on one supermarket but not on the other. And I'm not quite sure whether that is within our brief or indeed what we're trying to do. Because that wouldn't be fair to Aldi, and it wouldn't be fair to their competitors next door. You know, can we be sure that the noise actually is only coming from Aldi and not from also next door? So, you know, we've got to be careful on this. Although I am inclined, I recognise what uh, Sean has written about the sound. I know how difficult it is to measure sound. You've got a steady sound, fine. 
a mine to show when we stood by a, a wind turbine and everyone's saying it was very, very noisy. And I couldn't hear any noise at all. But then you said, I'm not a very sensitive person, so I wouldn't, would I? Um, <laughs> I don't know if you can remember that occasion. Noise is a difficult one. Some people can accept it. Some people it's downright irritation and loss of sleep and all sorts of things. But I'm prepared to accept Sean's thing because it is management. I'm hopefully that what it's got there is not unfair from a competitive point of view with the supermarket next door. If that's my only reservation with it. Well, that's that's irrelevant and it's not the application in front of us, what's going on next door, I'm afraid, Councillor Pearson, but your point is taken. Thank you. Any more debate? Councillor Gordon Smith. Um, yes, I, I asked several questions about the nature of the pallets that were delivered. Um, and I have the uh, experience of living next door to a co-op store. And I can state that the noise made by the pallets being unloaded is very disturbing. There's a, 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 a regular, well, a more irregular clash of the steel as they're pushed from one end to the other. And having to listen to that for an hour, well, an hour of, un of unloading and loading, is quite an experience. And I, I'm, you know, I think the original condition on the hours was set for a very good reason. And I'm always very reluctant to give way on a condition. Um, you know, it's always thin end of the wedge stuff. And you may remember last month, we had somebody complaining about a pine tree on the road that dropped cones into his garden. And I thought, well, you know, that it's there already. You have to have a very good reason to change it, and I don't think there is sufficient reason to change it. I mean, obviously, it, should, it would suit Aldi to have a wider transport schedule and so on. But the people living now, I mean, there's a lot of disturbance on the Sunday evening. I, I'm, I would be very much, very much against accepting this. OK, thank you. Councillor Davey. I listened intently to what Councillor Pearce said. I think he's got a very good point. I think Councillor Gordon Smith has also got a very good point. These trucks are controlled very tightly on their time schedules. The depot knows exactly where they are at any given point in time. And I cannot see any reason to change the hours for this. Um, we have to take into consideration that they are in a residential area. They've also got another supermarket yeah. next to them, and that would give an unfair advantage to them on that point. So I cannot see how we can change the uh, conditions on this, particularly relative to the noise and environmental issues. Councillor Wallace. So I, I understand a couple of points. I understand that. Um, we need to, Aldi need to be able to deliver product outside of operating hours. So that the, uh, the shop is open until 4 p.m. They need to be able to deliver outside of that. Um, but, um, and I'm, I'm reading from the report here and it says, uh, uh, 7 p.m. is not considered to be an unsocial hour. It says uh, noise levels from delivery Activity up to up to 7 p.m. on Sundays and bank holidays would not give rise to a significant adverse impact, and and these are in the context of nationally recognised standards. And I I have concerns that by allowing deliveries up to 7 p.m. and now we've had the clarification that we're actually allowing noise up to 8 p.m., which might be beyond those nationally recognised standards. So I I do have concerns about this. OK, members, I think I'll just draw your attention to the fact that this is recommended for approval and has been thoroughly looked at by officers. It's a simply three hour extension once a week um, to 7 p.m. And that is what is conditioned. So I think any noise after 7 p.m. we are legitimately uh, going to be objecting to um, under our enforcement rules. 
Um, I think that the extra conditions are sufficiently strict to make sure that it is absolutely clear to Aldi that they need to train their operators, that they need to make absolutely every effort to limit the amount of noise that comes from these deliveries and improve the environment for their neighbours. And I don't think that what they are asking for is unreasonable. And I think that the conditions that we are attaching um, make that um, a perfectly reasonable thing to expect. So I'm happy to support the officer recommendation myself. Councillor Edwards, you want to contribute? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I found this quite hard to balance the different interests. Uh, I mean, we all like fresh produce on the shelf when we go to the supermarket in the morning, and um, we all don't like to be disturbed on a Sunday evening, I guess. And we live in a small city. Um, what's really important to me is that there is no change to the fact that there will be only two deliveries per day. So if there is noise at six on a Sunday evening, it's because there wasn't noise at three on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and I think that's something we, we need to keep hold of. Um, I think on balance, I'm, I'm going to support the proposal, but I do think we need to make sure that these conditions are, are carefully monitored. Thank you. Any further contributions? OK, with the amended conditions on page six of the update sheet, so um, in the first additional condition, it's the refrigeration units shall be turned off for the duration of the delivery. Um, this um, application is recommended for approval. Can I see those in favour of approving this application, please? Five chair. And those against? Three chair. No, I think that's four. Four, four chair. Three. Okay, that application is approved. And that's the end of today's planning committee.